Hey guys, Noah here with Learn Meta Analysis, and in this video we're going to be talking about establishing research questions. So really what our goal is, is to identify what makes a good research question for various different types of systematic reviews. So let's drive straight into this really and think first, what makes a good research question? Well, in my mind, it's not too different between review studies and primary empirical work, but Personally, I like to make sure it is not a yes or no question. That way, no matter what the answer is, we still have room to talk about it. Second, we need to make sure it's actually something we can answer using whatever methodology we have chosen. And third, we need to make sure it sets you up for having something that is both academically and intellectually interesting. Now, what do I mean by this? Uh, what I mean is it's really easy to come up with things that you find intellectually interesting, things that you are just curious about, kind of think are interesting, fun, or cool. But finding something that is scientifically interesting, or in this case, I use the term academically interesting, is a little bit different, right? This is something that the larger field is going to find interesting. So we need to make sure that we are both searching for questions that are academically interesting and intellectually interesting. The reason I say it should also be intellectually interesting is because you're gonna be spending a lot of time conducting a systematic review. It doesn't matter if it's a scoping review or a meta-analysis, it doesn't really matter what type of review it is, you're gonna be spending a lot of time reading about this content and then analyzing this content. So you wanna make sure it's something that you're actually interested in. All right, so let's talk first about scoping reviews. Rem recall that these are really descriptive and they're really kind of high level, trying to understand the nature of a field. So let's look at some examples, okay, of what these types of questions might be. They might ask the question, how have studies around virtual reality and education been conducted? And perhaps what this type of study is focusing on is trying to analyze the theoretical frameworks that are used, the interventions that are used, the age of the participants who are participating in these studies, and what is measured in the study. Next, how are we measuring self-efficacy in the field of pedagogical agents and pedagogical agents or virtual characters? So for example, in this study, we might be focusing on, again, the theoretical frameworks and the type of measurement being used. Last but not least, let's look at the third example. What body of evidence exists around the use of augmented reality in K-12 classroom settings? And in this example, we might focus on describing the sample. We might look at the theories that are being used, the methods that are being used in the field, who the participants are, what they're learning about. So this ties back to the methods, but thinking about the, the contextual factors that come into play and also what is being measured. Now I will say in my area of education, which is uh, kind of the intersection of educational technology, educational psychology uh, is where I do most of my work. This third question here is a good example of what I would expect to see as a type of scoping review question. And the reason is because it can then lead to systematic reviews or meta-analyses that follow. It's trying to help us really understand in depth all of the different parameters of the studies in a specific research area. So with something like this, as the example states, we might be looking to understand what theories are being used in the field. Maybe that's gonna highlight something that's truly missing. Uh, if we are looking at the methods, we might find that there's specific interventions or specific areas where there's a lot of evidence, and then there's others where there's almost none. So exam for example, I know a lot of times we tend to lump all the STEM fields in together, but there's a lot of discipline-based uh, research out there focusing on specific disciplines. So maybe, and this is purely hypothetical because I'm just making it up for the example, but maybe we, if we were to actually run this study, we might find that there is some augmented reality research around science education, maybe ecology, but we're not seeing much around, for example, engineering education. And this means that we can use more primary studies in that area if it's warranted. So this third example research question is probably what I would expect to see in a lot of the areas that I work in. All right, so now let's talk about systematic reviews. And again, descriptive information is okay, but it's not really okay alone, okay? We don't wanna be that person publishing a systematic review that reads like a scoping review, okay? We wanna make sure that we are actually synthesizing data. We wanna be able to say, we have done the synthesis, so you don't have to, right? We're gonna look at all these things and talk about what they mean together. So this is really the key differentiator of a good systematic review from a scoping review, in my opinion. It really comes down to the amount of synthesis that takes place because a lot of times, scoping reviews aren't necessarily interested in the outcome. They might be interested in what's being measured, but they're not interested in saying one intervention is better than another or something to that effect. Instead, systematic reviews often look at that type of thing. 
So again, as I mentioned previously in a different video, systematic reviews are often a mixed methods analysis. We are really leveraging uh, qualitative thematic analysis, but there tends to be some sort of descriptive statistics provided as well. So let's look at a few examples really quickly of what these types of research questions might be. First question, how should we design pedagogical agents for university students to learn most effectively? And in this type of study, we might be focused on the design components of agents. So this would be things like whether or not they used animation, what types of animation they had. So for example, were they using different types of gestures? Uh, what did the virtual character's clothing look like? What age was this virtual character? What role were they playing in the learning environment? Were they helping to teach or were they teachable? Maybe they had really low self-confidence. Uh, so there's a lot of different factors that can come into play in virtual character design. And those are the things that we might be looking at with respect to learning outcomes. Now here's a second example. What dialogue strategies have been the most effective when conversational agents engage with learners? So what might this study be interested in? It might be interested in focusing on strategies. So because it does say what dialogue strategies, so obviously we're going to want to examine the dialogue strategies that are being used, but we might also want to look at contextual features. So uh, what strategies are being used in collaborative learning environments as compared to one-on-one -on -one conversations? There's a lot of different questions that could be built into these overarching questions. Okay, so now let's talk a little bit about meta-analysis. And again, as a reminder, these are quantitatively focused research synthesis. We're trying to understand what all the results mean together in a quantitative fashion. So these are generally focused on impacts or relationships. A couple examples for us here. What is the impact of pedagogical agents on learning? Again, pedagogical agents are virtual characters. So what is the impact of pedagogical agents on learning? We would be interested in comparing uh, agent condition to a non-agent condition to see what the effect is and what moderates these effects. Now, this is what's really unique about meta-analysis. And what I really like about meta-analysis is yes, you can find out the overall impact of an intervention, but in some cases you may end up finding that that overall impact number isn't particularly meaningful because there's so many confounding variables. This is going to come down to your inclusion and exclusion criteria, but we'll we'll save that conversation for later. But for now, we can just I want you to know that it's important to do these follow-up analyses. So I call them moderation analyses. Sometimes you'll see them called subgroup analyses. But what moderates the effects of pedagogical agents on learning? This gives us the opportunity to see how other variables impact the overall effect size. So earlier I mentioned the idea of gestures. Perhaps we're interested in, we have a theory that says that gestures can impact how well pedagogical agents influence learning. Or perhaps we have some sort of theoretical perspective that argues that agents that are the same age as the learner uh, help learning more than agents that are older. And we could test that doing these uh, moderation analyses. The important thing is that we have some sort of theoretical framework to tie it back to. Second, what is the impact of virtual reality on learners' motivation and what moderates these effects? So similarly, we would have some sort of theory-driven moderators to help us determine if some of these other factors that theory suggests might impact the overall effect size actually do or not. All right, so let's quickly summarize what we have just discussed. First and foremost, the question that you ask matters. I know sometimes it seems like research questions are just kind of these rushed things. Oh, get something down on the paper, blah, blah, blah. It'll make us feel better. That's not really the purpose of our research questions, okay? The research questions are going to help us shape and frame our entire systematic review. So we do need to put some good thought and time and energy into deriving research questions that are number one, going in, in my field anyway, are going to be theory driven. Number two, are going to be academically and scientifically interesting, and as well as intellectually interesting. And number three, are actually answerable by the methods that we are using. So as I mentioned previously, I like prefer to use open-ended questions rather than yes-no questions. Imagine this. Imagine we have the question, how do virtual characters influence learning? No matter what we find, we can answer that question and we can answer it in depth. Meanwhile, if we were to ask, do virtual characters improve learning? Technically speaking, we only need a yes or no answer. So what happens if it's non-significant? I guess we could still say no, but it doesn't give us any opportunity to elaborate. And that's why I like to use open-ended questions. 
All right, so just to rehash some of the things here, questions should be academically and, interest, and intellectually interesting. You're going to be spending a lot of time on this review, uh, generally speaking anyway. You know, perhaps if you only found 100 studies that qualify uh, for abstract review, then maybe it won't take that long. But if that were the case, unless you're in a very, very new field, I would probably make the argument we need to revisit your search string and the database is being searched. But we can, we're, we'll discuss that in a different video. So keep in mind, we want academically and intellectually interesting questions. Second, we want to make sure that these questions actually are answerable using the method that we have decided to use. Okay, so this is really important. Uh, and I've seen people go about this both ways. Number one, I've seen people establish their research questions and then pick the method. Number two, I've, I've found people who say, I want to do a meta-analysis on this intervention and then they since they know they're doing a meta-analysis they come up with a research question so i feel that this kind of is one of those things that will organically happen you'll either have a really interesting question that you want to check out and then you need to pick a method that helps you address that or you'll have some method that you really want to use to, to like investigate whatever your field is but you don't pre precisely have a good question yet you just know that this is the type of question that you want to ask and so you can then set up your questions once you have your method uh, in my field anyway, and in many fields that I've read, we need to make sure we have good alignment between our uh, research questions and the relevant theory in the area. Not only will this help us with our writing, but it helps us let the reviewers know that we understand what we're doing and this isn't just some purely exploratory study. All right, so that summarizes uh, how we can establish our research questions for various types of reviews. I hope you found this helpful and I'll see you guys in the next video. Thank you.